Such good energy this morning. Hello, and welcome to Neighborhood Unitarian Universalist Church here in Pasadena. Welcome to all members, friends, and guests here in person and virtually. My name is James Coombs, and I, it's my honor to serve as a member of your Board of Trustees. Neighborhood Church creates and grows an inclusive community of faith connected by love, spirit, service, and Dodger Nation. We acknowledge, we acknowledge our presence on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Gabrielino Tongva peoples, the traditional caretakers of the lands and waters of this campus. With respect to the rights and wisdom of indigenous people, we acknowledge our harmful colonial histories, including Chavez Ravine, and commit to decolonizing, and commit to decolonizing our own practices, to learning new ways of being in community with and with each other, and in good relations with the indigenous peoples of this land and with the land itself. Today's service is led by Senior Minister Reverend Dr. Omega Burkhart, with music by music director Dr. Zaneda Robles, associate music director Wells Lang, and the Neighborhood Choir. Please take a moment to silence your devices as we begin our service. And thank you for joining us as we continue to prioritize connection over perfection in this hybrid service, which is streamed and recorded on YouTube. Families with young children are always welcome in the sanctuary and in the narthex. Our order of service and extensive announcements are available as a link in the Sunday email, posted in the narthex, or through the QR code on the back of your hymnal. You can always get more information on these and many other activities in our newsletter. And if you are visiting we would like, and you would like to find out how to get more involved, please stop by the welcome table on the porch of Neighborhood House today because the weather is a little inclement. And again, welcome to Neighborhood Church, whoever you are and wherever you are in your spiritual journey. Welcome to this inclusive faith community connected by love, spirit, and service. Go Bruins. <laughs> And please welcome, <laughs> and please welcome neighborhood church member, Josh Rowe Hupler, who is here to talk about the final weekend of the 24-25 pledge drive. Josh? Thank you. Batter up. <laughs> All right, good morning. My name, oh, good morning. There we go, got the timing. Got it on the second pitch. Uh, my name is Josh Rowe Hupler, and I have been a member here at Neighborhood for just over a year. I sit on our finance committee, and I'm also a member of our 20s and 30s group. Now, for those of you who don't know me well yet, uh, I grew up Unitarian Universalist, and my wife and I married here in Pasadena and were married by a UU minister. Uh, Shelby, who is one of our Pledge Drive co-chairs, is a good friend of mine, and she asked me to speak to you all about the Pledge Drive. So, I'm going to offer you an update. I'm going to share a vision with you of where we are and where we could be. And I'm also going to invite you to join me in enabling this church to continue to thrive. As many of you know, we are sliding into home on our pledge drive. <laughs> this is the last Sunday we will be talking about the pledge drive. And 80%, and we are 80% of the way to matching the number of families that contributed to our pledge drive last year, which is great. I wanted to say a big thank you to everybody who has already contributed. You will ensure that this community continues this year, in five years, in 10 years into the future, that our friends and fellow congregation members have a strong, vibrant community to be a part of, and that those who have not yet found Unitarian Universalism will find a spiritual home when they need it the most. However, this also means that 20% of our families still have not pledged. And we are quite short of our goal still. Right now, we're sitting at $465,000 pledged. We are $85,000 short of our main $550,000 goal, and actually $165,000 shy of being able to pay a fair wage based on geo-indexing for our staff. When we look at UU congregations of our size, 
our average contributions are, are short of where they should be on a per member basis. And I know that the resources exist for us to hit our goals. And to be blunt, our 550K, our 630K goals should not be a stretch for us. And so when I look at where we are right now, I, I feel a little conflicted. The goal of our pledge drive is to provide a budget that can support our staff support our minister and our programming. And I know that this is important to every member of our congregation because I know how incredible, caring, and open-minded our community is. And I've seen that time and time again over the last year. But at this moment, our pledging actions are not quite in line with the values that we aspire to as a church and as a faith. These actions communicate so far that we have great intentions and strong values but we're not taking the steps needed to make them a reality. This is not a narrative that I want for our church. This is not the one that I think we want for our church. And I also don't necessarily believe that it reflects who we are. Our true story, I believe, is one of passion. I believe that what we want is to lay the foundation for a church where the music continues to be incredible, where childcare is available for all parents, where we provide innovative programming, where our youth can take OWL, where we add more and more new members each year and provide support and community to the members who have been with us already for decades. You, sitting here in the audience, watching from home, I'd like to ask you what story you want. Because believe me, you have the power to bend the arc of our church towards greatness and towards prosperity. There are so many wonderful people and opportunities here. These are the sparks, and we need financial fuel to keep those flames of passion alive. But we are in the last days of this pledge drive, and these days will inform what we're able to do with the budget in a few weeks' time. To that end, personally, I am doubling my pledge increase for the year. Thank you. I am but one person, <laughs> and this is not going to close the budget gap, but it is what I can do. And if I can do something, I know that there are others in the audience and in our congregations who can do something as well. If you haven't made your pledge yet, please make one. If you've already pledged, thank you, and consider if you can add just a little bit more. Join me. Honestly, beat me, please. I don't just think that we can meet our goal. I think that we can smash it. I know that we can. Please prove that I am not wrong about us, about the heart of our church, that we do put actions behind our words. Prove that we will not put our staff in a position where they struggle to make ends meet. Prove that we will not waste our own time and our church administration's time looking for ways to cut costs when we're already spread thin. Prove that we will have a robust budget that enables an incredible next year for Reverend Omega, because I know she has one planned. Help me show that neighborhood you use do not just talk to each other about what is right, but that we do what is right. And join me in ensuring that we are a beacon of hope and love. For those of you who've already pledged, take a moment and verify that you got an email thank you for pledging, because that's how you know that we got your pledge. And we will be right outside the sanctuary after services. Come chat with us and make or renew your pledge. Thank you. In addition to our choir today, we are delighted to feature our soloists Carla Jamie Perez, and later Tiffany Lantello. I'd like to dedicate this um, selection to my wife, Marcy, who um, is batter up right now and really working through a tremendous challenge uh, with a never give up spirit. Oh, the road of life 
can be a circuitous path. I said a parson here, the universe laugh. If I falter or I stumble, I'd let it get me down. Listen close, you'll hear me mumble. I'm just getting to good. If at first I don't succeed, I try, try again. Cause sometimes things just don't work out according to plan. I won't let a failure stop me. Don't think twice, I start again. Won't let others' judgments rock me. No, man, I'm just getting to good. All of life is but a game. Every miss improves my aim. If I hit a wall, I'll find a door for sure. The rules of another game say three strikes, you're out. Well, keeping score is not what I'm all about. Every day is another inning. Every play is a new beginning. If I foul out, I'll keep swinging, man, cause I'm just getting to good. church of baseball. I've tried all the major religions and most of the minor ones. I've worshipped Buddha, Allah, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, trees, mushrooms, and Isadora Duncan. I know things. For instance, there are 108 beads in a Catholic rosary and there are 108 stitches in a baseball. When I learned that, I gave Jesus a chance. But it just didn't work out between us. The Lord laid too much guilt on me. These are not my words. These are the words from Annie, who is played by Susan Sarandon in the movie, baseball movie, Bull Durham. She goes on to say, I prefer metaphysics to theology. You see, there's no guilt in baseball, and it's never boring. I've tried them all, I really have, and the only church that truly feeds the soul day in, day out, is the church of baseball. So come and let us play ball together this morning. We'll light our chalice as a symbol of our gratitude for the team's of which we are all a part. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing our opening hymn number 1010, We Give Thanks.
Good morning. Good morning. I'm Matt Vasco. I'm the director of spiritual exploration here at Neighborhood Church. And I'm wearing my Toledo Mud Hen shirt. <laughs> That's right. I grew up in the country outside of Toledo, Ohio, and this was our minor league team, the Mud Hens. <laughs> so they're actually pretty good, I have to say. So funny name, but a great team. Could I have all of the children and youth forward for a story for all ages, please? Come on up. So I've got a baseball book today. It's called The Thing Lenny Loves Most About Baseball. And it's written by Andrew Larson with pictures by Mylan Pavlovic. What do you want to say? <laughs> That's a fair question. Why is this church talking about baseball so much? Any guesses? Well, it's spring. Baseball season's starting. And we have a new minister, a new settled senior minister this year named Reverend Omega. That's Reverend Omega right there with her baseball cap on. And she's a baseball fan. So we're talking baseball. So let me read a book. You know, it's funny. I said it's a book about baseball, but we know how kids' books work, don't we? It's really a book about other stuff, too. There's a robin in the outfield. There's a kid on second base. It's springtime in the park. One day I'm going to play in the big leagues, says Lenny, throwing the baseball. And I'll be there cheering you on, says his dad, catching it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll come tilt it down a little. Thanks for letting me know. Here, I'll do that. It's the first game of the season. Lenny is in the outfield. The batter blasts the ball with a crack of the bat. Lenny tries to keep his eyes on it. He moves forward, then backward, then Lenny peeks out from behind his glove. The ball is on the grass at his feet. Thud. Oh, no. People are saying, you're not supposed to be scared of it. You're supposed to catch it. Good try, Lenny. Good try, says Dad. Dad's always supportive. Thanks, Dad. Yeah. That night, Lenny looks for more facts in his big book of baseball facts. Babe Ruth, 714 career home runs, 1,330 career strikeouts. Babe Ruth struck out more than he hit home runs. Hank Aaron, 755 career home runs, 1,383 strikeouts. <gasps> Same thing with Hank Aaron. Babe Ruth and Hank Aaron were great players. They were all-stars, Hall of Famers, but they struck out more often than they hit home runs. They weren't great all the time. I love that about baseball, says Lenny. You only got to be great part of the time, right? Yeah. Yeah. The next day, Lenny and his dad watch a game on television. Catchers are lucky, Lenny says. They get to wear masks. They need the protection, says his dad. 
I have an idea, says Lenny. Let's go to the park. What about the game, says Dad. You said I need to practice, says Lenny. Dad, uh, oh, sorry. Lenny says, don't laugh, adjusting his helmet. He's got kind of a, kind of a knight's helmet on here. Who's laugh? Oh, Roman knight. Very good. Yeah, kind of Roman. You're right. Roman-esque, as we say. Who's laughing, says his dad. Then Lenny's dad throws the ball high into the air. Lenny tries to keep his eye on it. He moves to the right. He moves to the left. Then the ball lands on the grass at Lenny's feet. Good try, Lenny, says his dad. Good try. Let's keep going, says Lenny. Lenny catches a few. He misses a lot. But he doesn't give up. There he misses. There it bounces next to him. There it looks like he's going to catch it. Pictures, pictures. Lenny and his dad are back at the park the next morning. I'm ready to try without the helmet, says Lenny. His dad tosses the ball high into the air. Lenny keeps his eye on it. Then he moves this way. He moves that way. Then... (gasps) Thwap! The ball lands snug in the pocket of Lenny's glove. Yes, says Lenny. Way to go, Lenny, cheers his dad. Let's keep practicing, says Lenny with an all-star smile. I want to get good at this. It takes, pra- it takes practice to get good. It takes practice. We call that a growth mindset. <laughs> yes. It's the second game of the season. Lenny's in the outfield. It's the last inning. The game is tied. The other team's batter hits the first pitch. Lenny keeps an eye on the ball. He can tell where it's going, and that's where Lenny goes. He puts his glove high in the air, and then, thwap! The ball lands snug in the pocket of his glove. Way to go, Lenny! Cheers his dad. Yes! His teammates call out. Great catch, Lenny! Oh, he caught it this time. All right, he's getting better. Practice is paying off. The next batter comes up to the plate. She swings at the first pitch and misses. She swings at the second pitch and misses. She swings at the third pitch and crack! The ball goes flying like a rocket. It's going, going. It flies over Lenny's head, over the fence, into the trees. It's gone. It's a home run. Lenny has never played a game where the ball flies over the fence and into the trees. I was always impressed with people who could do that. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think I'll have a home run someday, says Lenny on his way home after the game. If you keep swinging, says his dad, did you see see me catch that pop fly? You were great. I felt like a real player. You are a real player, his dad says. That's the best part about baseball is going out for ice cream after the game. Yeah. (laughs) That night, Lenny looks at his big book of baseball facts. He wonders if one day he'll be in a book about baseball. He knows he can be great some of the time. And maybe that will be good enough. Yes. That's the thing Lenny loves most about baseball. The end. So just remember, with practice, you get better at things, and you really only have to be good enough. 
All right, let's sing our children and youth out to their spiritual exploration classes. Each Sunday, our congregation dedicates 100% of its contributions to a 501c3 organization or a neighborhood church-based social justice activity that is making a difference in our community and around the world. Each selected guest or organization aligns with our community's mission and values and is nominated by church members who are often longtime volunteers and supporters of these change-making organizations. In addition to placing your donation in the plate, Online giving is available using the QR code on the donations box just outside, in the outside the sanctuary or by using the text instructions that are on the screen. If you wish to make a payment towards your pledge or contribute to church operations, please make a note in the subject line or use an envelope available at the donations box. And this week, our gifts will support Jericho Road. Here to tell us more is our guest, Kim Olpin, who is Executive Director of Jericho Road. Kim, welcome. Well, that was really adorable and very hard to follow. Um, <laughs> but good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm excited to be here. I'm a little sad I didn't know about the baseball theme. I would have worn a, a Dodger cap and tried to weave in some metaphors, but uh, I'll just have to enjoy everyone else's uh, shirts and caps today. Um, but thank you so much for having me here again today uh, to speak about Jericho Road Pasadena. As many of you know, uh, in 2010, some members of this congregation formed Jericho Road Pasadena uh, with the intent of creating an opportunity for them and others to donate uh, their time through skill-based volunteering. Uh, and so we're now in our 14th year. Uh, and yeah, <laughs> and with that, um, I'm forgetting the statistics, I should have memorized them, but we've had, we've helped over 300, 300 nonprofits in the area, uh, over a quarter million dollars worth of volunteer service uh, and more. And so I'm really excited to be here uh, in, during April is when I usually get invited and that makes me very happy because April is Volunteer Appreciation Month. So it's only fitting, given what we do, uh, to, to come here and talk to you about what we do, especially because so many uh, congregants here have been volunteers for Jericho Road, either through us for other nonprofits, who've been, or members have been on my board, or have donated in, their time directly to Jericho Road. So I want to thank all of you uh, who've ever volunteered in any way, with not just us, but anywhere. Volunteering is uh, vastly important to the nonprofit community, and it's so uh, it does so much individually. I've been a longtime volunteer myself, which is why I love working with volunteers. So I want to thank any of you who who have ever donated your time. Um, I want to share a little bit about some of the, the new things Jericho Road is doing. Last fall, we took a survey of a lot of our nonprofit partners to find out what they think about us um, and understand their needs a little bit better. And what we found is that they don't just see us for skill-based volunteering anymore. Because of the amazing volunteers we've had and the, the knowledge and expertise they've shared, we've become a place for knowledge and ex where nonprofits come for knowledge and general nonprofit expertise. They look to us as a resource for that information beyond the volunteers themselves. So because of that, we've actually start expanded to start offering skilled workshops and trainings for nonprofit staff. Uh, and we've got either, we've already done or in process grant research working with corporate partners, DEI fundamentals, earned income strategies, and a lot more. It's a really exciting growth for, JR for JRP, and we're getting really great responses from our nonprofit partners. So we're very excited about where 
what started here, where we're growing uh, and moving on to, and how many more nonprofits we're going to be able to support. So, again, all of the work that we do is a direct result of this community. Um, just NUC has been such an important part of uh, both our past, obviously, because you. We were founded from here and our present, and I really hope it'll continue in the future. We're so grateful for all of the support that all of the congregants in the church have shown us in the past, and we're, uh, we're always looking for new ways to help continue to expand how we support the nonprofits. Uh, and we only can do that with your help. So we still need you to keep supporting the work we do in our community, because uh, remember when you donate to JRP, it's not just going to us, it's going to support nonprofits all across the community. So your cont contribution goes a really long way in making a positive impact. So thank you once again for having me here today. Uh, I hope you all have a wonderful day and play ball. <laughs>this morning, I would like to share with you a song in the form of a poem. This is written by John McCutcheon, entitled Sermon on the Mound. <laughs> he showed up one summer and he stayed for a week. He could eat like a horse and he could cuss a blue streak. They say he pitched for the Reds before he landed in jail. He was my father's oldest brother. He's my Uncle Dale. Mama said, he's trouble. And Daddy said, he's kin. He opened up the door and he walked right on in. He would holler through supper and he'd cry through grace. That summer, our house was a mighty strange place. I remember one evening, he took me to the back lot. He tossed me a ball and he said, show me what you got. But before you let her loose, boy, you'd better listen to me. Ain't nothing is forever, and there ain't nothing free. See, I had it all together, and then I let it slip away. You get just one chance here, no matter what they say. And folks are quick to remember and slow to forgive, and that ain't no way to play, and that ain't no way to live. So play every game like it was your last. It don't do nobody any good to be wild and fast. Keep your head in the game and your eye on the ball. Know when to take and when to swing for the wall. You got to be determined as a devil and selfless as a saint. Keep between the white lines and hit them where they ain't. If you play for the team, you won't ever stand alone. And remember, in the end, you want to be safe at home. 
Don't play for the glory. It's gone before you know it. Play for your heart and don't be afraid to show it. He was gone one morning as quick as he came and I never saw my Uncle Dale again. Since then, I've heard a lot of preaching, but never found half as much wisdom as his sermon on the mound. You got to be as determined as the devil and as selfless as a saint. Keep between the white lines and hit them where they ain't. If you play for the team, you won't ever stand alone. And if you're smart and you're lucky and faithful and true, if you play by the rules but still steal a base or two, and if you play for the team, then you won't ever stand alone. And remember, in the end, you want to be safe at home. Thus concludes our reading. Well, I spent some time in the Mudville Nine watching it from the bench. You know, I took some lumps when the mighty Casey struck out. So say hey Willie, tell Ty Cop and Joe DiMaggio, don't say it ain't so, you know the time is now. It's gone and you can tell 
My grandmother, in her 80s, discovered her deep and abiding love for baseball. Her days in Dogtown, a neighborhood in St. Louis, were mapped out around two important activities that only those from Missouri, or Missouri, if you're from there, can understand. Her two activities were her morning walks at the zoo in Forest Park as part of the octogenarian fitness club called the Wild Side Walkers, <laughs> and watching the St. Louis Cardinals baseball games on TV in the afternoons and the evenings. She was also the organist of the same church where she and my grandfather met and had been members for over 60 years. Her love of church organ music eclipsed only just barely at the end of her life by the stats of the hottest Cardinals players of the teams of the late 1990s. As I move uh, through my life and I grow in deeper relationships with my colleagues and musicians and friends and congregants, I have noticed a trend of, dare I say, religiosity about baseball. There's nothing particularly ironic or incongruous about it, but I suppose it feels a little incongruous and perhaps, perhaps it relates to some weird cultural thread left over from the Puritans who considered any time of leisure activity to be sinful. I guess it's a good thing that Unitarian Universalists don't hold sin as a guiding creed because a lot of us would surely find ourselves on our way to a fiery end <laughs> were we to admit our love of a lazy afternoon at the ballpark. Thomas ba Boswell writes, true, there are differences between baseball and religion. There's no way around it. Religions have at least one God. Baseball has only demigods. Religions know the truth with a capital T. Baseball only has statistics. Still, nitpicking aside, they're about the same. Baseball is religion without the mischief. <laughs> this month, as we explore the value of interdependence, I think that one of the best examples of how it is demonstrated in our human lives is through play. Children play and they imagine together, they create games and play games, and as adults, we sometimes forget how to play. We begin to take ourselves a little too seriously. Perhaps sports, either watching or playing if it's part of what we like to do, perhaps that is a form of play. Perhaps we can engage in that as a form of religiosity. It is possible to take play seriously, explains theologian and sports enthusiast Joe Price. And it's possible for faith to be an act of play. And play is an exercise basically of the spirit. Watch children in a playground at a park. Their spirits soar. And isn't it what we aspire to cultivate in faith communities? To have adults' spirits soar? Michael Novak also describes it this way. Sports have a metaphysical significance. Play is the goal of life. Work is a necessary diversion. Now, many of you know that I lived in Milwaukee, Wisconsin for about 16 years, and our family home was within walking distance to Miller Park. Now it's called American Family Field, but anyone who predated that called it Miller Park the home of the Milwaukee Brewers. It was living in Milwaukee where my love of baseball grew. I played as a child, but my love of baseball grew. Coincidentally, or maybe not, right along my, alongside my Unitarian Universalist faith. So I'd like to offer an invitation to you 
to consider all the ways that our spiritual growth as Unitarian Universalists is, is like the game of baseball, aside from the fact that we also have jumbotrons. <laughs> this is not about the stats or the history or the players or whose <clears throat> team is best, <laughs> but rather it's a meditation on the game, on the love of the game as a player and a spectator. Now, my first epiphany about baseball did not come when I played as a youth or from my parents or friends or spouse. It happened one May Saturday afternoon at an urban park in Milwaukee. I was sitting in my lawn chair in the grass, spring dandelions at my feet, a cold soda in my koozie, and I was directly between the outfields of field one where my 10-year-old was playing and field three where my seven-year-old was playing. <laughs> it was perfect. I could root on both teams loudly. I was seated by myself. That didn't stop me. I was still, still quite loud, no doubt embarrassing both of my children at the same time. I was totally happy. I was completely present in the moment. The sounds of the birds and the people mingled pleasantly. I could feel the dust from the infield as the breeze blew through the park. My beverage was just cold enough, the grass just long enough to dig my toes into it when I slipped off my sandals. It was a moment of zen. I was completely present at that time. And that is when I realized this deep connection between those who look for mindful ways of living, those Zen masters, and those who love baseball. Perhaps some of you have seen a series of shorts created by the MLB. If you look them up, you can Google uh, baseball Zen MLB, and you'll find them. These 30-second spots time capsules, moments, images, sounds of what it's like to come out of the dugout in the bright lights. The sound of the crack of the bat hitting the ball. For those of us who practice meditation and mindfulness, we may have some of the same feelings of awe when we enter our sacred spaces, perhaps here in this room, or on our patio. The colors may seem a little more vibrant. The air has a certain quality to it on a warm Sunday morning. The coffee may taste extra good here on the patio because you're with your beloveds. Just like a hot dog tastes better at a stadium than pretty much any other hot dog anywhere. The birds and the city noises form a distinct, not unpleasant, but a distinct backdrop to our meanderings, a gladness and contentedness of gathering in community in a place that buzzes with intention and shared experience. There is a commonality in the ways that we engage in religious community and how we might engage in a sport like baseball. Here are some of the things that occurred to me when I was comparing the two. Maybe when you were little, you were brought as a child to this church by your caregivers, and maybe you were brought to play Little League by a parent. It's where we learn about ourselves and others, how to get along, how to work in conflict, how to be a part of a team and be accountable to a group. Later, as we grow older, maybe we delve in more. If we're playing sports, perhaps we play in high school or competitively. Just like in our church lives, maybe we go all in for youth group and youth cons and adult, young adult spiritual exploration classes. And then maybe there comes a time when we leave it, thinking, well, it's not really for us. We turn our explorations of ourselves elsewhere Maybe one day, after some time, you find yourself back, this time with your own kids, and you remember those fondest lessons of your youth, and you decide to volunteer as a spiritual exploration teacher 
in your church, or you become a coach on your own child's little league team. Either way, you spend time finding ways to encourage others in growth and practice, teaching skills about conflict, resolution, and introspection. And then one day, you find that you're at a stage in your life where all you have to do is focus on the love of the game, the love of the community again, the love of a baseball game well coached or a spiritual life well tended, finding connections with groups and congregational activities. If you're like my grandmother, you buy season tickets and you find yourself loving the experience of an early afternoon game when you don't have to think about your to-do list or other responsibilities. You appreciate the grace and preparation of the players, the intricacies of the plays, and the gratitude that you no longer have to arrange any of that for anyone else. Perhaps while you're watching the game in your recliner, you doze a little bit. Perhaps as you sit in the pews of the congregation, you doze a little bit. <laughs> That's okay. You attend worship services the same way you let your consciousness float in and out of the space as you need it to do, and that's fine. Writes poet and baseball enthusiast, Donald Hall, the diamonds and rituals of baseball create an elegant, trivial, enchanted grid on which our suffering, shapeless, sinful day leans for the momentary grace of order. Maybe church does the same thing. Now, for some of us, our teams change. <clears throat> Look, they're one and one in a three-game series. So we'll see about this afternoon, okay? Calm down, it's all right. Our teams change, we change, we find ourselves new in similar places, we find ourselves in new places altogether. In a few weeks, we will welcome new members into this congregation. So to those new members who are here today, if you've been attending for a while, and you've decided to officially join this congregation by talking with Ginger or with me, we are so glad that you are here. And in a few weeks on the 28th, we will celebrate you and joining this community, joining this new team. And we are very happy. These rituals are important for a church community just as they are for baseball. And another similarity that I am reminded of every time I go to a game or I come to church, which is, I love the music. I love the music. Now this is more of a liturgical thought rather than a theological. I love the walk-up song. And if you haven't been to a professional game in a while, the walk-up song is the little snippet, it's about 10 or 15 seconds long, that is curated to play right when a player comes up to bat. It's kind of to hype them up, also gives us as fans a little bit of a snippet to their personality. Now, I am no expert on the walk-up songs, but boy, there are website after website devoted to ranking the walk-up songs <laughs> of players. And I suspect because of that and because of my own thought about it, probably some of you have thought about what your walk-up song would be. <laughs> I have one. I'm not going to share it with you, but I have one. So what would yours be? You imagine yourself there, you're in the dugout, you're waiting for your time in the sun. What would your walk-up song be? Would it be a concerto? Would it be something by Tupac? Paul Simon, Carmina Burana? Now imagine a piece of music that you associate with being a Unitarian Universalist. What is your UU walk-up song? Maybe it's a walk-in song. What hymn is church to you? You have one. 
You might have more than one. What piece of music brings tears to your eyes or causes you to sing with wild abandon? Is it spirit of life? Is it Blue Boat Home? Blue Boat Home is incidentally referred to as you, you free bird. <laughs> by my colleague, the Reverend Kimberly Debus, who is a Unitarian Universalist music historian. Now, our connection to specific songs does... Yay! ...unite us with a place and a time. I knew that was coming. Boy, you did not like that Padres cap. Whew. In a communal context, we gather in, in our churches and our synagogues, just as we gather in our marches and our baseball games, gathering in song is a ritual that binds us together as humans. And sometimes the songs are playful, sometimes they're mournful. When we sing together, our bodies calibrate, our heartbeats calibrate. When we sing center field or wild thing at the stadium, or in the case of number 17, Shohei Otani, Lupe Fiasco's When the Show Goes On, which is a delightful play on his name, by the way, if you have never thought about that. We sing these songs as they take the field. We are gathering in song too, a whole stadium of people united in the shared experience, a whole congregation of people united in the shared experience of making something magical happen together. Something magical between a team and fans. The music highlights that teamwork, that relationship between the two. I am part of a team here in this congregation. And I, I, don't, I don't know about the Dodgers yet, still working on it. But I am part of another team here, a staff team at Neighborhood Church. And to the staff of this church, some of you are here today, some of you working, some have gathered here I am grateful for you. I am thankful for you every single day because you hold the container that makes our gathering possible. I am proud of you, and I know that the past several years of transition have been tremendously hard, and I'm so glad that you're still here with us. And I look forward to many years working together to make magical things happen in this field of dreams that we have right here. <laughs> Baseball games and church worship services. We have teams, we have players, we have stadiums, music, food, moments of quiet calm, away from the complications of the rest of our lives. So the next time you or someone you know says, you know, I don't like watching baseball because it's boring, maybe you can remind them that's the point. <laughs> the slowing down for a little while the watching something magical about to happen. Voices synchronizing in song, pushing your toes into the grass, feeling the breeze on a sunny spring day, eating a hot dog, being part of a team united in a shared goal. And maybe the next time someone says to you, you know, I don't like going to church because it's boring. You can remind them that's the point. <laughs> the slowing down for a little while, the feeling the breeze and the sunshine on the patio or the raindrops, the sharing a cup of coffee, being a part of a team united in a shared goal, voices synchronizing in song. So play every game like it was your last. It don't do anybody any good to be wild and fast. Keep your head in the game. 
and your eye on the ball and know when to take and when to swing for the wall. If you play for the team, you won't ever stand alone. May it be so. Please rise in body or in spirit and join us in singing our closing hymn. Take me out to the ball. of enthusiastic singing with every hymn from now on. James, lead us in a wave. church of baseball and I believe in the baseball of church where the rituals create an elegant and sometimes trivial but enchanted grid on which our suffering and our shapeless days lean in for momentary grace and order. Let us extinguish our chalice today and hold playfully to that tiny spark of shared experience the spirit of sacred gathering and the love of the game. Blessed be, guess you say, amen. <laughs> 